In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There is a particular human characteristic that enables us to dislike or even hate groups of people we've never really met. Now, if you doubt this, I challenge you to wear a visiting team's jersey to any sports game, especially in the Northeast during baseball season or in the Southeastern Conference during college football season. Good luck. Some of my most exciting memories as a young man involved watching two people that have never met each other get into a fist fight while the Mets and Yankees played on the field. Unfortunately, we don't confine the ability to decide that another person is an enemy to sports arenas. We do it in so many ways, based on the country someone is from, the neighborhood someone is raised in, the color of someone's skin, or the language someone speaks. We determine if someone is an enemy by the color of his tie, or perhaps the cable news channel he or she chooses to watch. Humans, all of us, have the innate ability to make an enemy out of a potential friend, and unfortunately, we've mastered this skill. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus interacts with someone who most would consider an enemy of the Jews. You see, the Jews and the Samaritans have a contentious relationship, even to the point of armed conflict at times. There was deep division between them, especially regarding the location of the true temple where God is to be worshipped. Based on the woman's and disciples' reactions, I would say that Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well was very controversial. Not only are they perceived enemies, but it would be highly irregular for a man to speak to a woman who is not a relative alone in a public place. Further, being alone, her being alone at the well indicates that she is an outcast from all the other women in her community. We quickly discover why. According to Jesus, she's had five husbands. She's essentially the Susan Lucci of the Samaritans. One of the reasons I find this interaction so interesting is because Jesus speaks to the woman so frankly. He doesn't hold back. After the woman says she knows the Messiah is coming, Jesus tells her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. So far in John's Gospel account, Jesus has had private conversations with Andrew and Simon Peter, Nathaniel, his mother, the Virgin Mary, Nicodemus, and now this Samaritan woman. In all these conversations, there are veiled hints of who Jesus is, but this is the first time we hear Jesus say it plainly that he is the Messiah. And he reveals it to a Samaritan. A Samaritan who's not just on the outs with the Jews, but who is also on the outs with her own people. As soon as Jesus tells her who he is, the woman leaves to return to the city and she immediately proclaims the gospel. Jesus has turned an enemy into a partner. The apostles' reaction is to question Jesus inwardly 
and to fuss over him to ensure he's had enough food. Jesus teaches his disciples in this interaction that this ministry, the ministry of an apostle, is much larger than anything they could have imagined. The mission of the gospel is so much larger than anything anyone at the time could have imagined. And sometimes we must remind ourselves that the mission of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is not limited to the people we like or the people who think as we do. The gospel is for everyone, even those who we perceive as enemies. In the end, our faith assures us that love wins. St. John tells us in his first letter that God is love. If we believe God will win, we also believe love will win. What does love win? What does God win are both the wrong questions. Whom does love God win? Whom does love win are the right questions. In the end, God wins back his creation. God wins back his people. God does so by using the no matter what love he has for each one of us. The no matter what love that was made flesh in the incarnation. What is our best response to God's unconditional love? In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul tells us that answer today. St. Paul says this, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Through whom we have received reconciliation. Through whom we go daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly and proclaim that we have erred and strayed from his ways like lost sheep. When we recognize our sins and that we all fall short of the glory of God, we can then turn our faces towards God to ask for his forgiveness to receive the unconditional forgiveness of all our sins by naming them before God, by repenting, and by intending amendment of life. When we do this, we enable ourselves to offer forgiveness to others, to break down the walls of division that the enemies of God build to prevent us from realizing how alike we all really are. If one thing can bring people together, it's the realization that we're all in this together. And we can all work together. As Christians, it's our call to do away with petty disagreements and to come together in the name of Jesus Christ to let everyone know that God loves the world and desperately wants all people to receive that love and then to offer it to each other. What's more difficult for you? What's more difficult for you? To understand that God loves you unconditionally? 
or to realize that God loves the person you perceive as an enemy unconditionally. All humanity bears the image of God. All of us. The church's responsibility is to help everyone understand that we only have one enemy. That enemy is there to distract us from God's love. Insist that we fight each other and steal our souls for his own selfish needs. Let's not let the enemy win. Let's come together in the name of Jesus and receive the grace of God and then offer that same grace to the world. In Jesus' name. Amen.